Now, a tribute to the late Dermot Morgan, presented by Miles Dungan. Well, Miles, the five accused before the court are named as Dermot Morgan, Pauline McLean, Jonathan White, Gerard Stembridge, and a Mr. Dermot O'Reilly who was charged with impersonating the TV presenter Mr. Gay Byrne. They heard how the scrap document had been forged by Morgan and Stembridge, assisted by Julian Clare, and how Mr. Lachlan Butler Jr. had engineered the scam. Witnesses identified Mr. Stembridge as the director, and it was at this stage that a struggle erupted as they all rushed forward and bit the judge on the penis. The late Dermot Morgan in the radio series, which was uh, the first to properly utilise his tremendous talents, talents which uh, now have sadly been lost since his shocking and untimely death in London last night. Tonight we're here partly to mourn his passing, but I think more to celebrate the great wit and the wickedly satirical sense of humour which he shared with us during his short life, and we're, uh, I suppose, here to drink to the death of a clown. Let me begin by uh, declaring a personal interest. I've known Dermot for a decade and a half. We were less than intimates, I suppose, but far more than acquaintances. In that uh, time, I've seen him up, down, up again, and finally triumphant. I've listened to his repartee, been the victim of his sharp tongue, and been kicked and jostled by him on the football field, and uh, generally enjoyed his company. Tonight with me in studio are two of the people who've been closest to him personally and professionally. His uh, frequent collaborator, Jerry Stembridge, and his friend and relative, his cousin, Donna Morgan, a man who found himself uh, working closely, in fact, with three Tishi at a time when Dermot was lampooning all three of them. We'll talk to him about that uh, presently in our Limerick studio, where we hope to be talking also to one of his prime targets, Michael Noonan. And on the phone, we'll be joined by some of his friends and his admirers. And the second part, the second half hour of this tribute programme will be the broadcasting of a full Scrap Saturday from November 1990. Donna, let's uh, start with you. Let's start with, uh, first of all, how the family of Dermot Morgan are coping with this shock bereavement. Well, Miles, it's still not real for us. Um, we're trying to get our heads around it. Uh, I'm still waiting for him to call. Uh, I know he was looking for me on Thursday evening last rang my wife missed me, rang him back, didn't make it and um, Probably to tell you you're only a bollocks which is easy um, to do frequently. Words like that or some other more unprintable ones that, you know, wouldn't be suitable for your radio programme. Mm. Yes. Jerry, how did you find out about it? Where did you hear of? Um, um, I suppose I'm glad to say that it, it was in a, a least in a personal way um, it was Pauline phoned me from London this morning, Pauline McLean um, who Again, we both have a, a long-term contact with him. I mean, Pauline's been a good friend of mine for years. Was the, uh, the the female end of the of the Scrap Saturday team, um, along with Owen and myself and Dermot, and then um, and then of course continued to be his cohort uh, on Father Ted. And so she's been working with him for the last ten weeks, and literally just finished on Friday night. And she woke up this morning to a to a phone call telling about it, and, and she she phoned me straight away. Um, and y you know we. <laughs> We, we just didn't know what to say to each other. What, 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 okay, what to say? It, it's, uh, it was, it, it, it's, but I mean, what, what, you, you really start thinking, it, it's, it's strange because I've, I've probably become more upset as, as the day goes on. When I, when mm. I first started, I just thought, oh my, you know, you just are, 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 are shocked by it. But what's been, what's been curious as the, the days goes on and just the series of phone calls and people coming in and, and really people have been treating me as if I, I was a, a close relative or a brother, but I suppose, you know, friends of mine who, uh, 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 who knew of my certainly working partnership with, with Dermot were phoning to offer condolences and so on. And, and, and what has struck me actually is I'm, I'm delighted to say the, that the extraordinary swell of, of, of goodwill that I think we'll, we'll become even more aware of in the coming days and realise just how much people love someone who can make mm. them laugh, you know, more than anything else. There's like real affection mm. for, for that and, and shock. I became aware of it listening to the Sunday show, uh, increasingly aware, shall we say, without actually knowing, and uh, became aware, I think, when Andy O'Mahony mentioned a tribute from the Taoiseach to Dermot, uh, and I was wondering what this was all about, and because of the fact that uh, one doesn't get tributes like that until one has passed on, sadly, I got worried and uh, actually rang the Sunday show to find out what was the, what was the problem, and uh, we can actually give the Taoiseach an opportunity to repeat uh, that tribute which he paid on the Sunday show this morning to Dermot because uh, Mr. Hearn is on the line uh, now. Good evening to you, Mr. Hearn. Good evening to you, Miles. Um, your memories of, of Dermot? 
Um, if, Miles, if I can just first say to Donna and, and of course to all of the family, um, my heartfelt sympathies. Uh, Donna, of course, has worked with me for a long number of years and different capacities in, in, in Leinster House and, and now in the research department. I didn't get a chance of talking to him, to him today, though I got the message through from, from him earlier on this morning through my private sec, so my sympathies to him. Um, I think he, he was a, a, a person who uh, made life a bit happier. Um, and politics is a fairly serious business most of the time. We're dealing with a lot of the, the, the tough old lines of the day and the, the, the problems and uh, the difficulties and of course you know sometimes it's it's easy enough to have a go at us but i i think he did it in a way that that was genuinely funny and it was light-hearted and you know in in all the times and, and I, i'm glad to say it's we're not saying this just when when he's unfortunately left us but uh, he, he was discussed plenty of times in the doll restaurants and the bar uh, over all of the years and uh, genuinely i think people could take it from him because of the way he did it uh, there's other people around who who have a go at us or people in newspaper columns have a go at us and we we take it more resentful to be quite honest about they're it. not as funny yeah well i think he he he, he did it funny and he, the, the fact that he was he, he was full of life and i suppose the fact he spread it around a bit too he didn't just concentrate on us and uh, i i think that that made it and um you know i had a, a chance a number of chances of, of meeting him around the years and um, the Christmas Christmas of last year, um, Donna and, and myself had a, had a few points with him uh, up on Bagger Street, and we had a good old chat. And we were talking to him at that time. He was talking to me about how, how life was going so well for him, and uh, you know how, how things were taken over from a, from a business point of view. And even though being a great uh, comic, a great comedian, that you know everybody has to, to make a crust, and he felt, I think, genuinely happy that things were going well in his career going well and I felt happy for him as well that that's the way it was and how do you think he did you he did you a lot uh, he did me a lot yeah well you know, he, well actually you know I'm a bit harder to do than, than, than mm. some people because of accents and uh, he, he, he quite frankly wasn't very good at it I, I, <laughs> I, I, I think we could debate that Fishing. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> on, on, on the contrary Bertie I, 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 I think he does you better than you're doing you but, uh. <laughs> he, he, he was able to pick up a few of the words on the, on, on the pronunciations and he had those for him right all right there's, but, there's people but, listening around the country and saying that's not Bertie Hearn that's, that's someone doing a bad impression <laughs> 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 but, but he, I know he, I, I'd have to say mm. he, he was good funny and you know I was on a number of the shows and, and he wouldn't have known where, where he, he was demolishing me but you know you, you can take it when, it, when, when it's, a, it's a show if, if it's somebody doing it behind your back well you feel a bit resentful but if somebody does it straight yeah, on he never bothered to do it behind anyone's back they should mm. really. no well, you, he, was, he was too busy <laughs> <laughs> well thank you very much indeed uh, for, uh, for for joining in our tribute and for your own Thanks thoughts and that. tribute and uh, sympathy to his family man. indeed indeed and uh, thank you very much for your tribute to his uh, talent let's go back and let's go back not to the beginning of Dermot Morgan but to I suppose the dawn of the career of Dermot Morgan, uh, something again I'm, I think those of us here remember, I remember it myself, I remember University College Dublin uh, back in the 70s and Big Gom and the Imbeciles, a takeoff of Big Tom and um, one of the others involved in that enterprise was uh, Billy McGrath who joins me now on the line. Billy, your memories of, of Dermot during that period? Well I remember being in UCD and uh, myself and Dermot... I'm surprised were, you do yeah. actually. Wait, what's, 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 what's that? I said, I'm surprised you actually remember being in UCD, but carry on. Uh, I do. No, no, we used to, uh, myself and, uh, uh, myself and uh, we, we had a little group called the Spike Milligan, uh, the Spike Milligan, the Spike Milligan, uh, the, Spike Milligan uh, the Spike Milligan Comedy Machine, and we used to run sketches, and a month later I was approached by this guy called Dermot, who wanted to run a show called The Big Com and the Imbeciles, and uh, I remember he asked me would I dress up as a nun, and because he wanted to involve... Uh, a trio of nuns called the Sisters of Satan in the same group. And I was delighted to say that I did. But uh, I think that was probably, I remember watching his first performance. And I suppose I'm really, really glad I was actually in the studios last Friday night to see his last performance. And uh, there's been 20 years in between. And the me my memory of Dermot, and I suppose myself in some way of trying to uh, carve a lonely furrow and introduce him to the comedy as, in, into as many areas as possible is that he never gave up he knew he had a talent, he had a dream and he had a will and uh, I know that Dunno will remember this, his frustration of working in the RDS and his will to leave to go into full time entertainment and I suppose the saddest thing as a lot of people will probably talk about is that now he's, he was becoming recognised as an actor I know, I know he was developing a screenplay and a film uh, 
based on a story with uh, our Bishop McQuaid along with Jerry. And I know that Granada were very interested in taking an option up on a new sitcom where he was going to play a Dutch ambassador. You don't think that he had time to enjoy what he had actually taken so long to build up despite all the discouragements and the reverses that he had along the way? Well, probably that's a sad thing for me. I think he was really just, I mean, again, as I say, it was the last episode of Father Ted. And speaking to him briefly, but also speaking to John Fisher, who has worked with him for years, the sense of excitement on what was coming next. And I think that's, that's, that's the sad thing, where he'd be known as, uh, like, like he was known as a big gum in student days. He was known as Father Brian Trendy in later days, and then he was known as Father Ted. And I, I just wish that sort of people hadn't, uh, that he didn't become the Dermot Morgan. I think he was an all round entertainer. I think he was a brilliant entertainer. Indeed. And uh, I think in retrospect that people will remember, just like Elvis or John Lennon or Princess Diana, they'll always remember the time where they were when they heard that Dermot Dem- Morgan had passed away, and that's... that's, mm. I mean, that's Tribute indeed. Day. Billy, thank you very much for talking to us thank tonight. You. Thank you. Billy McGrath there, who was uh, an associate and long-time friend of Dermot Morgan, and as you heard Billy say there, who was actually present at uh, the recording of The Last Father Ted. One man who has been at the receiving end of uh, many of Dermot's snipes, and indeed many of those of Jerry Stembridge, is uh, Michael Newland from the Grail TD, who joins us now from our Limerick studio. Uh, Michael, I won't even bother asking you how well he did you, because he did you probably, as Jerry would say, better than you did yourself. Star Awards program above and down. Above in, 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 in the old examination <laughs> hall in Belfield, the concert hall. That's my terrace, you know. And I was going out to. I don't think Michael Newland. Michael Newland, can you actually hear us? Uh, they're looking for me, I think, on the other yeah, side. We are looking for you on the other side. <laughs> We're actually talking to you on the other <laughs> side. Hello, can you hear us? Michael. Okay, well, we haven't got Michael. Well, okay, we haven't got Michael Newland as yet hearing us in there. But what we do have is this. We have an example of Dermot doing Michael Newland, and hopefully we'll be able to make the comparison between the two. This is something that uh, I recorded with Dermot many years ago, prior to a Eurovision Song Contest in the RDS. Twenty-four hours is a long time in Eurovision Song Contest. There'll be a few uh, people from Fianna Fáil who'll be trying to keep their seats here from the last Ardesh. So it is up to us. To be ever vigilant. Is that, is that to sit and to hold the seats. Those people off the bag, is that, is that who they are? Uh, you, 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 yeah, you, like can see, you can see the shine off their necks. Okay, well, that uh, is Michael, and hopefully we'll be able to talk to the man himself. But another victim on the line now, Mara. Good afternoon, good evening, PJ Mara. Good evening, how are you all? Um, did you know the man well? I did. He was uh, a very good pal of mine. And uh, we used to meet quite a bit when uh, less frequently recently obviously because he was away working but when he was around town we'd always meet for a lunch or drink a beer or or three or whatever so yeah he he was he, he was a friend and um, I regarded him as such always and how did you regard his talent I thought he was terrifically talented uh, and uh, sometimes I worried about that because um, you know and I've heard a lot of people saying it today that uh, you know, I think he was so, but he was um, bubbling over with talent, and I think sometimes that he needed to to restrain himself a bit and uh, be a bit more, uh, and maybe or, not, organized is not probably not the word, but he just wanted to do so many things. And if you met him, he was different to other people in in comedy, or you know that you know when they're off stage, they're off stage. Dermot was always trying out new things or telling you about new ideas or. Uh, new walks or new uh, voices or uh, new concepts. You know, it, it depended on just what you know what you know what was bothering him at the time. But he was all the time thinking, plotting, scheming, uh, and he'd share that with you. You know, even when the the ideas were only in embryo, if you like. And uh, he, it didn't bother you the Not fact that every single week on Scrap Saturday you were depicted as the lapdog, the <coughs> professional lapdog. Well, I suppose you know he didn't quite catch the. The real uh, sophisticated, uh, you know, thoughtful, <laughs> reflective me. <laughs> but uh, he always, uh, his explanation for that was like that, you know, when he started doing Scrap Saturday, that that very few people uh, had ever really heard me because I didn't. Uh, they all think you sound, you sound like Owen Rowe, unfortunately. Well, yeah, I'm going to carry that particular cross. Maybe I did. Maybe, maybe I, uh, maybe, maybe how I sound now is a response to that. But I think his his view on that was that no people didn't know what I sounded like. You know, the concept of the show was that Charlie Hoy was the all dominating, dominating 
scheming, plotting, devious um, power of the centre, and that I was some kind of Uriah Heep. And you know, that served the purpose, you know, of his concept, and, and it worked. And, you know, uh, I'm afraid there wasn't any, any point in my making representations for him to change that, you know, because... You mean you're denying it, PJ? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it didn't bother, didn't bother me at all, not at all. PJ, thank you again as well as uh, everybody else for for joining us in this uh, tribute tonight. And uh, let's just hear a little bit more of Dermot's mimicry and uh, somebody that uh, he made a reputation out of imitating and somebody who unfortunately uh, disappeared from the political scene a little bit too early uh, as far as Dermot was concerned. And that's uh, Garrett Fitzgerald because long before uh, Scrap Saturday, Dermot was building up a reputation as a mimic. Here's his take on Garrett Fitzgerald's preparation for the party leader's TV debate with Charles during the 1987 general election. Circumstances. <coughs> Try it again now. Economic circumstances. Circumstances. I must speak slowly. Slowlier. <laughs> Slowlier than thou, O Lord. <laughs> circumstances. These are the economic circumstances in which this country finds itself absolutely unprecedented. No, that's my, that's my opponent's uh, phrase. I better leave that to him. <clears throat> we move on to... Um, Mr. Hoy's pedigree. Uh, uh, indeed, um, perhaps uh, Mr. Reynolds be the man to help him with his pedigree, or indeed any other uh, pet food. <laughs> Mr. Hoy is a man who inspires fear in this country. <clears throat> Mr. Hoy <clears throat> is a man who's not to be trusted. <laughs> <laughs> and he did that, and I know better than anybody, he did that completely off the top of his head. He would do that kind of stuff completely <laughs> off the top of his head. That's, I mean, what, what PJ was saying is true, uh, Jerry and Donnie, you both know this, uh, that he was, unlike a lot of comedians, he was funny. He was a funny person. He was funny most of the time, it, wasn't it? Well, 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 one of the things he once told me about the, the, his, his approach to mimicry, for example, he, he, he described his Jerry Collins, that his starting point for Jerry Collins was like a, a, an old jalopy trying to start on a cold winter's morning. <laughs> 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 or, or Desi O'Malley was a sheep in pain. <laughs> that, that, that he had uh, th that curious uh, uh, ability that people really did take on uh, much more the spirit of the person rather than the exactitude always of that. And just there he caught, uh, even the, the, there in that spot in his uh, piece, he caught the spirit of Gareth Fitzgerald. And it, it, it was extraordinary that, that uh, what, what began to happen, I mean, I think when we talked to Michael Noonan, I'm convinced Michael Noonan has adapted to try and be more like the uh, impression of, I'm absolutely convinced of that. He, uh, and, and that's what people love because they recognise it isn't just that he's doing this by numbers, he's doing this, uh, but that, that he's capturing a feeling that they had a kind of yes that's the guy that's that's what he's really like that's the old soak that he is or that's the chancer that he is or that's the you know whatever as, as his cousin and his almost namesake Donna what was it like operating with Charlie Hawley Gareth Fitzgerald and laterally Albert Reynolds as Tishy while he was viciously on occasions lampooning them well Miles you can see the colour of my hair and I'm <laughs> still trying to let it grow out but I mean as, as you know Jerry the scrap used to go to bed on Friday morning now we played football on Friday the evening and in the shower after football I invariably got a preview of <laughs> the next morning's scrap now you were listening to uh, with PJ your P45. with my P45 <laughs> tucked in my back pocket and uh, I mean it was deadly accurate and I used to lose my life saying, oh my god I'm going to be fired you know <laughs> how am I going to live with this and of course it was the deep throat in the Taoiseach's office was feeding Naturally. him all this stuff but in fairness to him he never compromised mm -hmm. so people used, used to worry would we lose our jobs with the stuff we were doing in Scrap Saturday it's far more likely Donna would lose his job <laughs> Okay, now, uh, the other side of Dermot was that he was uh, always on the go. The mind was always working. The brain was always working. But uh, sometimes it was working too hard, mm -hmm. uh, i.e. he could be extremely disorganized and could be very difficult to work with at times. Uh, so that it could be, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you see, but to see, I mean, where he, where, where, where he sold it to me straight away and where I became a, a loyal follower forever after whatever about any any misgivings I may have had but it was you know because the first time he spoke it wasn't the first time he ever spoke to me but the first time he spoke to me about Scrap Saturday and persuaded me uh, to write stuff for him I thought I was going to be one of a giant team of writers by the way and then I found myself in himself in a lonely room but but that, that he... Lonely sweet, Jerry. He's lonely sweet. Oh, absolutely. He always did it in style. <laughs> always did it in sweet. <laughs> but, is, like, he swore blind to me and this is absolutely true that this would be, this programme would be the biggest thing 
to his Irish comedy, to his Irish radio, to his Irish... And I sat there thinking, yeah, 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 yeah. Mm-hmm. But you're going to pay me a few bob to write some sketches, so that's all right. And when I realised four or five weeks later, literally as soon as that, that I don't believe it, he's right. Mm-hmm. He was right. He had the ear of the country on, on this matter. And he was right. And it really taught me forever after that no matter how often he was wrong, <laughs> I'd still better hold on to the possibility that he'd be right because he had a great sense of what... And also, he had that thing which we, which we lack in Ireland, and I'm sorry that we lack in Ireland, which is... like He, was, he really was an idealist. He had faith that you, you could do bigger and better things. And it really, really... Like, if, if people found difficulties with him, it, for me, it was always because, no wonder, if he felt he was being held back from something he really thought he could achieve. Okay, so you're the man, Jerry Sternbridge is the man who was promised sweets by Dermot Moore. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. Um, somebody who was promised... a free lunch. <laughs> somebody who was promised nothing by Dermot Morgan, but he was lampooned, and I hope uh, is now hearing us in the Limerick studio, is Michael Noonan. Michael, can you hear us? I can, of course. How are you doing, Michael? How are you doing? We talk Limerick here for a while. How are you doing? Michael, uh, Jerry has just made the point that you have, since Dermot uh, lampooned you, began to, and indeed Jerry himself, on Scrap Saturday and elsewhere, that you have been attempting to live up to that, that you have basically modelled yourself on his model of you. Well, you see, I, was, I, I got very friendly with Dermot and we did a deal that any inexactitudes in his imitation I'd iron out. <laughs> <laughs> so I moved a little in his direction, he moved a little in my direction. So see, we I, became interchangeable for a finish. See, I, I, I grew up in Limerick knowing that, that, that Michael Noonan was, was a teacher in the classy Jesuit school uh, up there. He was nothing like the Limerick knacker that Dermot turned him into. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Jerry, you know, the first time I saw you was outside a polling booth reading a book, and I thought you'd never make it in politics. <laughs> the, the, the voters passing you <laughs> They were passing, passing me by. Passing you by, <laughs> not taking any notice of you. But uh, he, was a, he was a genuinely funny guy. And um, he was funny in co- socially, in company, and he was funny uh, in his program. And um, I don't think anything ever happened like it in RT before or since. It was genuine political satire. Most of what passes for political satire in the media in Ireland is just but you were one variations of the, on abuse. You were yeah. one of the lucky ones because you were the ones. You were one of the ones who did get imitated by him and did get lampooned by him. There were uh, many, many other politicians who weren't quite as fortunate. I suppose that's right. I suppose a lot of people would love to have been in the position, uh, especially now, of having been lampooned by him and, and, and being in the archives. Uh, but uh, I remember when. Scrap Saturday came on first. I didn't know it was coming and I was listening to it one morning, listening to RTE and it came on, you know. And it was absolutely gripping stuff. Absolutely amazingly gripping. And it was very risky as well. It was totally different from anything RTE had ever done before. And of course eventually it, it, it got too hand, hot to handle for RTE and they dropped it, which is a great pity. One of the great tragedies is that as all the tributes are being paid tonight, uh, Denmark Morgan really became a national star thanks to uh, television stations in, in the United Kingdom, not, not to RTE. And that is something, Jerry, which he resented. I mean, let's, let's be honest about it, let's be straight about it. He resented the way he was treated by RTE, both radio and television. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't talk, talk about that today because, really, you know, I mean, it, we should... The pleasure of, well, lest of we be, comedy. Lest we be accused but, of not t- addressing it. But uh, I, I, the, the, I mean, the level of his anger uh, against RT was, was enormous. And, and rightly so, because people have to remember that if you are a performer, if you are a comedian, if, you're, if your raison d'etre is, is the kind of social political comedy that it does, to be, to be cut off from the principal source, the national airwaves, whether radio, radio or television. I found it very significant tonight that in the in the television report that was on, they had to go back to 1980 to find a programme that Dermot uh, was part of, or around 1980, the, the, the live mic. That's 18 years ago. Mm. And yet everybody is, is talking about his extraordinary talent. Everybody recognised, the whole country recognised his extraordinary talent. It's one of the phenomenon of, of the age, really, is that is that it wasn't. One of his other passions, as, as we know, was football. And uh, over the years, he has made friends of various footballers and uh, a couple of soccer managers, including uh, the current manager and coach of the Irish football team, Mick McCarthy. Mick, you're very welcome. Hi, Miles. How are you doing? Uh, I believe you, like Billy McGrath, Mick, were present last Friday for the recording of The Last Father Ted. Yeah, I was. I was, I was there with my family, with my wife, Fiona, and my three children. And how did, what kind of, was he in good spirits? How did he, how did he appear? I'll tell you what, he was, he was in wonderful spirits. He, uh, it was his last show, and uh, I think when uh, you've been on, a, on, a, on something for eight weeks or more, constantly, he was on a high, he'd finished it, it had gone well, it was a great finishing, great finale. 
and it just it just tied up contacts with the BB, contacts with the BBC. Things were going well for him, and he it, it was on a high, and uh, he was on good form. Now he was a mad keen soccer fan, and I want to find out: is it true, as he told me on many many occasions, that you constantly pestered him, looking for advice on how to manage the Irish soccer team? I did actually. Yeah, yeah. No, actually, I think uh, one of uh, my and his biggest regrets were the the day I actually met him. He told me he was playing in in a in a five aside <laughs> competition in Dublin, and I said, and I was hankering for a game because I was staying in Dublin that time. And I, I threw all these hints to him, looking for a game, and he never took them up. Yeah, well, you see, he would, he would throw hints to you on many occasions as well, looking for a start on the Irish soccer team. He would always bring his boots with him, and you never took him up, so that was probably the reason. Yeah, I, I, I just thought he was... Uh, if I was going to pick a, a senior player, it was going to be myself. I, I was going to pick myself <laughs> for him. And I had no chance of a game, and I told him on many occasions he'd even less chance. <laughs> Um, you probably know uh, Dermot's cousin Donna, Donna uh, Donna, cousin yes, and friend, and yeah. also fellow soccer addict. Just put in perspective, Donna, this addiction that he had with the game of football. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's a, there's a funny story that goes with that, Miles, and Mick will remember it. How, how are you doing, Donna? How are you? <laughs> Good, Mick. How are you doing? Uh, well, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm great, but right? I'm obviously upset as well. Because sure, I'm yeah. Lost a good pal. I haven't known him long. But I've, you know, yeah, but you had become good pals, and I know that he was due to go down to your place in a couple of weeks' time. But I was, I was just going to tell the story of, uh, I think it was before the last international, and uh, we were out having one or two pints together with yourself and Ian Evans, and we, bum we bumped into Clive Anderson, and we got into a big soccer conversation, and uh, as you know, Dermot was big into the football. But uh, the following week, he went to London, and he met Clive Anderson, and he said, uh, Clive asked him, uh, how is that cousin of yours the assistant manager of the Irish team? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I'm, well, I'm, I'm, lo I'm looking forward to, to sitting beside you at the next international and giving you some advice. Make no problem, <laughs> no, I, I'm open to any advice. Make, and, and we might give you a run out in the five aside the next time you're over. Uh, Mick, I don't know, did you ever hear. Uh, uh, it's Jerry Stammers now, Mick. Uh, uh, Hi, I, I don't know, did you ever hear uh, a, a great gag he did at the tail end of one of his Eamon Dunphy pieces? where he claimed that uh, Mother Teresa would never make an international defender. You actually have it, have you? Have you got to tell you about it? Well, he's a, he's a, he's a good player. He's, she's, she's a good player. She's not a great player. <laughs> exactly. And, and, and he said she'd never make an international defender because she'd always be caught for pace, just like Mick McCarthy. <laughs> <laughs> Mick, uh, you, might like, you, might, you might actually, before you leave us, and uh, thank you very much for talking to us, you might actually like to hear this. Uh, hang on, this is... Well, actually, uh, can I, can I yeah? tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm actually here with... Uh, I'm here with one or two. I'm, I'm, I'm in a pub having a drink to have some friends with three Irishmen and uh, another good pal of his, Jack Charlton. So uh, you're on. there with Jack. Uh, yeah, we are. Well, and, uh, give him our best. Uh, I will, of, I will, of course. But we just we we will miss him because we. I've become good friends with him. I've known him what nearly not 18 months, and uh, he was such a lovely, lovely man. Mm. And uh, I just I feel so sorry for everybody that. Especially Fiona and Ben, and yeah. his other sons from his marriage, and uh, I really will miss him. I've become well, a very close friend of his. Yourself and Jack can raise a glass in his honour, and uh, well, I'm having a drink to absent friends, and mm. I have to tell you, I know for a fact he'll be somewhere looking down on us, and he'll be quite envious that I'm sat having a drink without him. But he would have, he would have moved on. I would. Okay, well, you and Jack, I think, would enjoy this. This is uh, from Scrap Saturday a couple of years back. The Arctic is like Millwall. It's a hostile place. Uh, not quite as cold, obviously, and perhaps a little bit more colourful, but it's a rough environment. I have met polar bears. Hey, beautiful po animals. Po polar, beautiful polar bears. Animals. Polar bears. Yeah. Polar bears are bullies. They are wonderful. They, they think they are nasty guys. I remember going in hard no. against this polar bear, trying to win the herring he had, and he hurt me. Mm. The polar bear was physical enough. He was hefty enough to hurt me, but Giles, he wasn't phased. He had the breadth of vision. He just smiled at the bear and broke his ankle. The he, ha he had to do hey, that. That hey, was the respect. Arctic. That, yeah, uh, no, I'll tell you another time when we were with Ireland, right? And myself and Ray Tracy, we, met behi we were behind, right? And we, we met these baby seals. Baby seals are pretty. They're, They're beautiful. Yes. They have big eyes. Exactly. And Ray and I had what? been away from home on this tour for a while, and we were starved of female company. Now, football. hold on. What football, are you football, suggesting? Football does that. So we asked the baby seals to dance, but Gilesy, the consummate pro, just kicked their heads in and sold their pelts to Joe Kinnear. That took bottle <laughs> and the club. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Um, success, did it change him, Donna? No, I, th I think the soccer is very important. Uh, it, it was important to him, it was important to the people around him. I I've been listening to the tributes all day from the well known names, but I think there was a group of people around him, sort of 
Blood Brothers, Soul Friends, the A Team, people like Pat Finn that you've played with, mm. Peter Redmond, and you know, he he did an interview years ago in the Evening Press, and he said, "It's my friends helped me to keep my feet on the ground. We never let him forget that." <laughs> Indeed. Um, there, gentlemen, we have to leave it. Thank you both very, very much indeed to, for, for joining us and to everybody else paying tribute to Dermot Morgan tonight. We're studio guests, Jared Stembridge and uh, Donna Morgan, also Bertie O'Hearn, Billy McGrath, PJ Mara, Michael Noonan and uh, lastly, you heard there, Mick McCarthy. And uh, now a special edition of Scrap Saturday from November 1990 in a week where, week where Michael Noonan was a local Limerick TD. Quinsworth was owned by Quinsworth Mike Murphy thought fire extinguishers were art and one of the world's most powerful leaders, one Margaret Thatcher was forced to stand down and Dermot if you're listening somewhere, from all of your friends and from all of your admirers as you used to say yourself, we'll be talking to you kid <laughs>